So we're going to finish up this series today that we've been in called When Life Hurts. Okay, the, the whole tempo of the service is about to change. <laughs> it's been so upbeat. It's been so uplifting. It's been, it's been so encouraging and joyful. But I, I want to just conclude this series with probably one of the most frequently asked questions that people have for, for pastors or for church leaders is, is why, if God is so good, why is there suffering? Why, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why do I have to suffer if God is so good? That's the title of today's message is suffering. Suffering. How do you like that? <laughs> We're off to a great start, everybody. We're going to have some fun. We're going to have some fun. And I, I, I do believe this. I, I really do. Because it's, it may not be the most hoorah topic, but it's something that we all think about, especially when we're in it, especially when we're in it. And I want to I wanna provide some answers to this. So the, the, the general answer, and if people ask you this, the general answer, the, the true biblical theological answer is easy. Why is there suffering in the world? Well, because there's sin. Because Adam and Eve, they sinned, they ate the apple, whatever, and the sin is brokenness, and now we're separated from God is technically accurate, but I but I understand something that it doesn't usually satisfy people. <laughs> when they ask, why is there suffering? It's because they want to know how to get through it, not why is it there? Usually, usually. But the technical answer is, yeah, that's why. That's why right there is because there is sin and, there's, and we've been separated from God because of that sin. And now we have to come through Jesus to, to be redeemed and, and to get that connection back. And uh, for the non-Christian, for the non-Christian, they, they kind of struggle with this because, hey, if God is so good, and he's so great, and he's so powerful, then why doesn't he just snap his fingers and make all the suffering just go away? And so that answer that I just gave, or that answer that you might give to someone else, it's not satisfactory because they believe if God is good and he's powerful, then God should be able to just remove all suffering. So people remain non-Christians because God just doesn't do it that way. He doesn't snap his fingers. He doesn't make it all go away. But God will remove, by the way, all suffering one day. One day he will remove all suffering that we ever have to experience, and that's what I'm going to conclude today with, but it's called his return. When he, when he returns, this suffering will go away, and we won't have to deal with it anymore because he is good, because he is good. Now, for the Christian, let's get to that because I'm, I'm, I'm assuming many, if not all, but at least many, there might be some watching online, there might be some of you even here today, you're still kind of on that journey, you know, you're like still figuring things out, and we welcome you, we love that, that's very much the kind of church we want to have, is where people can come in, and they can get to know the Lord on their journey, but I want to speak to the Christian for a moment, for the Christian, if we're sincerely following God and obeying him, then why do I have to endure suffering? If I'm doing the things I'm supposed to be doing, Okay, if I'm, you know, removing myself from those bad situations and I'm doing the right thing, then how come my life is going the way it's going? Pastor, so smarty pants, think you're all big and bad with your suit jacket on. Why don't you explain that to me, huh? It's, it's real, it's real. So I wanna talk to you today about the doctrine of suffering. Like, why is it a thing? Why do we have to go through this? And, and to be honest, it's a great question. That's a good question to ask. If we are following God and doing all the right things, how come we're having to deal with the things that we're having to deal with? It starts with Jesus' words to us to answer this. John 16 says this, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows and pain and suffering and correction and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> You're gonna have all the stuff. You're gonna have all the stuff. But take heart because I have overcome the world. So Jesus states that we're going to have all these problems, all this suffering, all this pain, but it still doesn't answer why. Why are we going to have those things? Why doesn't he just prevent all the suffering? To answer that question fully, I need to tell you about these two forms of suffering that people go through. And it's found in this passage right here, 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter's going to talk to us a lot today. All right, so just get ready for that. 1 Peter says this, if you are insulted or you're caused to suffer, Insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious Spirit of God rests on you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, for stealing, for making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. How many of you think that was going to be on the list? Right there with murder. Getting into people's business is right there on the list with murder. Getting into y'all's business is a sin. Come on, tell the person next to you. It's a get, stay out your business. Get out my business. All right, get out of here. So the suffering that we face 
is, is, is absolutely going to happen, but there's those two reasons. There's suffering for sin. It's like the, how can I explain it? Eating ice cream. Everyone loves eating ice cream, right? But uh, if you're lactose intolerant, that little bit of joy is going to lead to a lot of pain. Am I right? Somebody, a lot of pain, a lot of pain, but it feels good. And sin's the same way. It feels good for a minute, but it leads to a long time of suffering. Peter is telling us, hey, if you're suffering for that reason, there's a, there's a great way to get out of that. Just stop. <laughs> That's my kind of counseling right there. Just knock it off. <laughs> You know, no, 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 nobody's going to ask me for counseling after today's message. That's okay. That's all right. Suffering because of sin is preventable. You just knock it off. But it's not that easy. That's another message for another day. But the kind of suffering, the next kind of suffering that, that we need to talk about is the kind of suffering that you can't get out of. This kind of suffering that you can't avoid. You can't eliminate that. And it's, the, it's suffering for following Jesus. Suffering while you follow Jesus. This kind of suffering, you can't just make it away by changing, you can't make that go away by changing your behavior. You can't make it go away by just acting better, acting right, you know, getting out of the abusive relationship, getting out of the addiction, getting out of the stronghold. You'll be able to get rid of the kind of suffering that that produces, but then when you're following Christ and doing the best you can with what you have, then there's still suffering. And that kind of suffering doesn't go away this side of heaven. So I still haven't answered the question for you, and I'm about to right now. I'm actually going to answer it three times. There's three good reasons for enduring suffering and why there is suffering. And number one is this. Our mission has opposition. So let's say you're, you're following Christ and you're doing the mission, right? The one what we talk about every single week. We're going to be a lifeline by leading people to becoming lifelong followers of Jesus. Yeah, I'm doing it all the time, but I'm still suffering awesome. <laughs> Not so awesome. But our mission, the mission of Christ, the mission of following Christ, just following him comes with opposition. Knowing this helps us understand one of the, one very strange statement about suffering found in Colossians chapter one. It's, a, it's really strange, but I'm going to explain it to you in a way that maybe you, you've never heard. Colossians one verse 24 says this, I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body the church. Make sense to everybody? Okay, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Let me, let me just explain it another way. Jesus came to fulfill his mission, obviously, and he suffered in his body. Now the body of Christ is, is you and I. We are the body of Christ now, and the mission of Jesus is still moving forward, so the body of Christ is still suffering, just like Christ had to suffer for his mission, but you and I are now suffering on his behalf because we carry Christ with us, and we are pursuing his mission, so there is suffering. He is still suffering, like, through us. We are suffering through him. It is, it is an amazing statement. It is an amazing piece of theological truth that we are still carrying out the mission, and his body is still being persecuted. Like his literal physical body had to go to the cross, right? And he had to die on that cross for our sin. And that was his mission. And it's been fulfilled, but we're still, you and I are still advancing his cause. We're still advancing the kingdom of God. So when we carry him with us, his body is still being persecuted. You and I are his body. We are the church. You and I, I was just having a conversation recently with someone about the church. And I know what they meant. I know what they were thinking. They thought it was the, here's the church, here's the steeple. You know, inside of the church is more people, but really you and I are the church. Anywhere we meet, anything we do, when we're together, when y'all are playing pickleball out there, you're the church. When you and I are, well, pickleball is all I had on my mind. That's all right. That's okay. I'm obsessed. I played my first game of pickleball recently. That's <laughs> applause. Really? Come on. This is too much. This is too much. I got, I got smashed. I did so bad. I, th I used to think I was athletic and now pickleball has humbled me. Suffering has humbled me. That's my last point. Don't worry about it. We are carrying the mission of God to reach the lost, and that's opposed by the devil. It's called spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare, which is simply an attack against you driven by the devil. Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 through 10 says this. I know about your suffering and your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those opposing you. They say they are Jews, but they are not because their synagogue belongs to Satan. Now listen real, real quick. Sometimes suffering looks like it's coming from people. 
But right here in the scriptures, it says that it's really, there's, there's a spirit behind the people. There's a spirit influencing the people. People really aren't our enemy. It's really, we have one enemy. Our enemy is the devil. And sometimes he uses people that are unsubmitted to him to make us suffer. Okay. And that's what he's saying. Their, their synagogue belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil will throw some of you into prison. Was it like the tail, the pitchfork, go to jail. No, no, it wasn't. No, the people threw them in jail, but, but the devil was operating through them. That's what spiritual warfare looks like. It often looks like people posting on your wall or whatever, like whatever, whatever suffering looks like these days, you know, American suffering is like, they said they didn't like me (laughs) suffering. I'm just kidding. I, I don't talk that way about people. Come on. I, I know that you're, you're doing your best and you're doing a great job. The devil will throw some of you into prison to test you. You will suffer for 10 days. Another side note is that um, 10 in the Bible is a number for testing. That you will uh, be thrown into prison right here in the scripture for 10 days. That represents testing. There was 10 virgins that had the lamp oil and they were supposed to wait for the bridegroom to come. And there was 10 plagues in Egypt to test Pharaoh. There was 10 commandments to test the uh, Israelites out in the wilderness. The the tithe means 10. Uh Uh-oh. All right. That's a test too. All right. But the number 10, if you ever read it in scripture, it means testing. And there's a test going on. The Lord doesn't tempt us to sin, but he will He will check to see where your heart's at. He will check to see what's going on with you. So moving right along. But if you remain faithful, even when facing death, I will give you the crown of life. Ooh, good news right there. So wait, 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 wait. The devil's about to harass me. Great pastor appreciation message, right? This is great. The devil's about to harass me and I'm going to suffer. Yes, because our mission comes with suffering. And comes with persecution. And if that's not enough, our mission from God is also opposed by, obviously, because I already explained it, but organizations, people, like our actual country or different countries uh, that you could visit, whole bodies of people, whole organizations, whole groups. Why? Because we stand for an ultimate truth. When we carry Christ with us, we stand for ultimate, absolute truth. We believe in a God with moral absolutes and we, we live our lives with values that the world just straight up opposes. Straight up opposes, like, honestly, like you go to some places, you can't talk about just normal, good behavior without being, well, well, that's not what I think. That's not what, like, if you just go out in the world. I just visited a, a church out of state, went to Texas. Everybody thinks Texas is like the church capital. Well, not every city, okay? Um, this city I visited, Austin, was uh, this, it just the, the region, the culture was just so different that even saying like simple biblical truths gets, uh, you, they come right against you for that. The whole city is like against what this, ch- this church is doing so well, so wonderfully. They're, they're, they're moving the ball forward. They're, they're, they're representing the kingdom of God so well. And they want to like build a new property. And the city's like, no, you can't. Absolutely not. Like even if they do everything they're supposed to do, the city will oppose it. And that will happen to us too. As we continue to grow, as we continue to do things, because we're, we have spiritual warfare. And our mission has opposition. It's just the way it is. It's the way it is. And so it's important to understand that. And I'm going to continue to to explain it as we go on. Acts 9 says this. Meanwhile, Saul, who it will be named Paul later, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and eager to kill the Lord's followers. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. I thought he was persecuting people. And Jesus comes in and says, no, you're persecuting me. Now get up and go into the city. I will tell you what you must do. I thought Jesus was in heaven at this point. I don't know, I must have missed something. I must have missed a chapter. But Paul is persecuting people who follow Jesus, but Jesus sees it as him persecuting himself. This persecution against Jesus, the King of Kings, is carried out against us by the world today. It's no different. You and I, when, when we are persecuted for carrying Christ, it's the same exact statement that we're carrying Jesus with us. So when we face suffering, It's really because Jesus is still suffering to accomplish his mission, and we're just carrying him. We're just with him. Our mission, which is God's mission, has opposition, but there's more. There's there's more reasons to understand. And number two is this. You can write this in your notes. You can check this out on the app. But suffering for Jesus connects us with Jesus. 
That's the second reason I want to explain that suffering for Jesus connects us to Jesus. Have you ever seen any, any war movie, basically any war movie? I'm the only one I can think of is Saving Private Ryan, Tom Hanks. Oh my gosh. I love it. It's kind of gory, but uh, I'm kind of into that kind of thing. I'm like watching that. It's like so crazy. And they're, they're in there. The, the, any war movie, just picture anyone. And there's always like this band of brothers thing going on. They're in the foxhole. <laughs> oh man, we're not going to make it. And they're like cut and they're bleeding and they're helping each other. And then, you know, cut to when they're 85 years old and they still love each other. Right. And they're always like still getting coffee or visiting each other's like graveside or whatever. Cause they're all like any war movie kind of like shows that depicts that because there's something that happens in wartime that brings people together. Like no other event ever will. There's this bonding that happens through, through, through battle. And suffering for Jesus bonds us with Jesus. I don't know how many of you have ever really considered that. Because most of the time we're just praying, Lord, get me out of the battle. Get me out of this. But, but Jesus is in the foxhole with us going, no, come on. Like we're, we're going to make it out together. And then when you get out of it, you're like the band of brothers. We're connected with him in a way that we would have never been connected with him had we not gone through that suffering. That's why suffering is so crucial to every follower of Christ, that we experience some of this on this side of heaven, uh, on earth, as we're living our lives, we experience some of the suffering and it bonds us to him. It bonds us to Jesus. Sharing in the suffering of Christ is what we're called to do. First Peter, again, for God is pleased when, conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. It's like you're in the same prison cell with Jesus. That's what it's like. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you, he is your example and you must follow in his steps. We're like war buddies with Jesus. All right, he's the commander in chief, okay? He's the boss. But we're fighting this battle alongside him. Like you, you have a part to play in advancing the kingdom of God. You really do. And even sometimes just living life, it seems like a battle, doesn't it? Well, you don't have to raise your hands. I can see your faces, all right? They turned up the lights just enough. I can see, I can see. We've been through some battles in here. We've been through some battles. I, I know many of you and, and some of your stories, I know you've been through some battles. I'm telling you that suffering is bonding you with Jesus. If you will stick with Jesus in your suffering, that it'll bond you to Jesus in a way that no other experience really can. He could provide for all your needs. You could win the lottery. You could like pray for all your bills to be paid. You win the lottery and it's not gonna bond you to Jesus the same way that suffering alongside of him will. Are you seeing this? This is so powerful. Um, Paul, who suffered greatly for the name of Jesus, wrote this, Romans 8. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Okay. <laughs> it's still, it's not feeling easy still to me. Okay. I'm still, I'm right there with you. It's like, I don't want to go through this. I'm still not like, yeah, suffering, bring it on. Feeling good about it. Not necessarily, but understanding the value of suffering through trauma, the value of suffering through loss, the value of suffering while you're carrying the name of Christ, knowing that gives us a sense of ultimate purpose. I'm being bonded to Jesus. This suffering is connecting me to Jesus. Did you even know there's so many scriptures about suffering? There are so many. There are so many. More than I'd rather there be, but there just is. It seems like suffering for the sake of the kingdom to inherit the kingdom is what children of God do. The first son of God, Jesus, suffered to bring in the kingdom of God. Now all of us sons and daughters of God can expect to suffer to inherit the kingdom of God. It's just part of it. That's why Peter, again, one of the closest witnesses to Jesus' suffering was Peter. All right, Paul wasn't there. Peter was there. And he was watching from like his shame hole where he like got out of where he was supposed to be there for, for Jesus and he just didn't and he's like hiding from behind and he's over here peeking out, seeing Jesus suffering. Peter was a, was, was a close witness to this kind of suffering. So he wrote this, dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if sometimes, as if something strange was happening to you. 
Sometimes we think that, right? That we're suffering and it's like, oh, why me? Why does this stuff always happen to me? Am I doing something wrong? Peter's saying, don't be surprised when suffering happens. I've heard a, a great pastor say, um, it's not a quote of mine, it's just a quote I've heard. You're either on your way into a storm, in a storm right now, or just got out of one. So like storms are a part of life. Trouble, suffering, pain, it's all a part of life. If you're on your way out of one, praise God. If you're in the middle of one, I'm praying for you. If, if you're neither one of those things, get ready. <laughs> get your umbrella out. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is like a 101 class on how to grow your church the opposite way. <laughs> no, I hope it equips you. I really do. I hope this equips you and I hope it makes you feel a sense of confidence of your suffering has purpose. Your suffering has purpose and, and God sees you. He cares about you in the midst of the suffering and there is a purpose and it's supposed to make us stronger. The last thing, the last thing is this, last, last reason. There's more reasons, but I think this is probably the, the, the best one to end with. Suffering keeps us humble and dependent on God. Oh, man. Why'd you have to go there? <laughs> Why'd you have to go there? Suffering keeps us humble. Man, right when you think you got your stuff together, huh? Right when you think, man, I, I got the, look at me, I got the microphone all dressed up. I'm, I got my stuff together. Bam! Something just to make you humble again. And then you get a promotion, you get the little raise, you get the relationship you were looking for, and everything's going great. And just like I said, and when we're following Jesus, bam, something happens. And what does it do? It keeps us humble if we stay with Jesus through it. It keeps us humble and keeps us dependent on God. What is it about suffering that really draws people to church? <laughs> Why is it that it's always like, oh, when something terrible happens, God, I'm going to go right to church. Because there's some, it's in our nature. When, when we go through pain, when we go through trials, when we go to suffering, even the, the, the people of Israel, back in the Old Testament, when things got really, really bad, what'd they do? They cried out to God. And that's what he wanted. The same thing is true for us today. When things are bad, don't curse God. Cry out to him. It keeps us humble and dependent on God. So that's why our suffering has such a purpose. And when we get too a little big for our britches, Oh yeah, I've seen that before. Oh yeah, I've done that before. Oh yeah, I'll pray for you. You look like you need my prayers. Thank you very much. Suffering reminds us that we have not arrived anywhere except to the next battle. <laughs> That's where you've arrived. Think you're all big and bad. Well, you can look forward to something coming your way to keep you humble again. If you don't believe me, uh, let's, let's read from Paul one more time. Like the gangster of gangsters of the Apostle Paul, wrote most of the New Testament. This guy's awesome. He's the most awesome. But listen to what he has to say in 2 Corinthians 12. He, this, and this is right after, by the way, this is right after all of his boasting. He said, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was over here. I was, like, I was a Pharisee among Pharisees. I was the leader in this sect over here. I'm, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. And he, he clarified his boasting, had a purpose. And he was saying, if I was going to boast, I'd say, all these things. It's like, oh, that's really clever. So now it's not boasting. <laughs> slick, real slick. But after all of that, after all of that boasting, he says this, to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. This is the apostle Paul. He was given a messenger from Satan to torment him, to keep him from becoming proud. Verse eight, three times I begged the Lord to take it, take it away. This is a man who saw miracles. This is a man who, who, he just did everything. He saw absolute miracles. His prayers were answered and heard by God. This is the man, the myth, the legend. And he prayed three times and the Lord said, nope. Nope, you're gonna get to keep this one. I, I, I need you with a little bit of suffering in you. If I could paraphrase a little bit, if I could insert myself into this conversation, it's like the Lord says, no, you need this. You need this suffering. Paul, the apostle Paul was not above it. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So I am now glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness, my pain, my suffering, in the insults, the hardships, the persecution, and the troubles 
I boast about those things. Wow. For when I am weak, he is strong. It's like when we're weak, when we're weakest, God is strongest in us. It's like when we're going through our our deepest pain, all of your greatest testimonies, all of your most powerful ministering stories that help others, that, that you think back to as landmark moments in your life, those were times when you were suffering and God helped you. That's what Paul's saying right here. If I'm gonna boast about anything, it's about how much suffering I endured and stayed with him. Because my suffering keeps me humble and dependent on God. The, the, the first apostles, the, the first uh, disciples, they had to figure this out too. In Acts 5, it says this, they, the Jewish leaders that were coming against the disciples, called the apostles and had them flogged and ordered them never again to speak the name of Jesus. And they, then they let them go. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. These first disciples, these apostles had to change their mindset around suffering. They didn't rejoice in the beating and the imprisonment. They rejoiced in the purpose that they saw in it. They knew that this suffering is going to produce something. This, su- this suffering means something. So when they were, they're, out, they're getting flogged. You know what it means to be a flogged? Like a giant paddle. Whack, whack. And they're like, hallelujah. What's going on? Doesn't make any sense to me. But they rejoiced in the purpose of it. Their perspective on suffering was much different than ours today. Our perspective is, Lord, get me out of this. Please take this suffering away. Get me out of the battle. Please spare me from all pain, all trouble, all trials, all the stuff we've been talking about all month long. Pain, trials, correction, now suffering. Lord, get me out of this. But the, the, the apostles Paul, the disciples, they understood that when I suffer, there's great value in it. There's great value in it. Our perspective needs to change like theirs did. Come on, church. I, I know we live, in a, and we live in a prosperous country. Uh, even our community is like pretty spiritual in a, in a good way. You know, we don't face a lot of opposition. And when, when things happen to us, we... You know, we have to deal with that. But I, wanna, I want our perspective to change as a church that when we face suffering, it's, there's a benefit to it. I think that's what the word of God is trying to show us today is that when you suffer, God is making you stronger. It's like going to the gym, exercising, working out. We, 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 we inflict pain on ourselves so that we can grow, so that we can be better, so that we can thrive, so we can endure more pain later. Why? So that we can help others. It's our mission. This side of heaven, I know I've said that, that, that many times today, but this side of heaven here on earth, there's just going to be trouble. There's going to be suffering, and there is great reason for it. If we can embrace the purpose, that's how we give God glory during suffering. Our goal during suffering is to endure suffering in such a way that gives God glory. When we endure suffering and when others see our faith and our attitude— while we're suffering, that gives God glory. When, when we're going through suffering and pain and hardships and angels and demons see that, it gives God glory. When God sees you, and he does see you, I just want to remind you today, God sees you. He sees what you're going through. He sees your pain. He sees your suffering. He's not delighting in it any more than you are. But he has the perspective to see what you will become if you stay with Christ through it. And when God sees you trusting in him and your faith growing and your attitude being positive during the suffering, it gives him glory. It's only temporary, everybody. That's the good news. David wrote this in the Psalms. He said, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. (laughs) You know, it's a cute scripture. But when you're in the night, The morning never comes soon enough. Can I get an amen? It's hard. It's hard. I've been there. Many of you know my story. You know what I had to go through to get here. You know what I had to go through? I had to go through imprisonment. I had to go through a a rehab program. I had to go through losing, like basically losing my family and getting over here to, to absolutely start from scratch. I have no friends, no family to support and, and absolutely start right here. And this was the only family I had was right here in the church. The only family I had. And I, it was hard. I'll be vulnerable with you. 
It wasn't always easy. It was sad. I was lonely. I didn't know people. I, did, I wasn't connected. That's why we're so big on it. It's because I know that I personally experienced that. And I just want to, I want to end a little bit differently than we normally do. This is the end of our series. And so I actually want to impart something to you. I want to, I want to speak over any pain and suffering and trial or correction that you might be facing. And I just want to pray strength into your situation. I want to pray that you would be able to get through it, giving God glory. And in the midst of that, I also want to give you an opportunity to, to maybe come back to a place where you're giving God glory or, or honoring him. I know that many times in, in, in church that you're here, but you know deep down that you have kind of become disconnected from God. And you're here and everything on the outside looks great, Sunday best, all that, smiles, high fives, everything's good, but on the inside, you know you need to be closer with him. And you know deep down it's not he that moved away from you. I hope you know, and I'm going to be praying that you know. He's been waiting for you to come back. He's like a father who's waiting eagerly for a son and daughter to come back home. So I just want to pray over you, if, if that's okay with y'all. Is it okay? I'm glad. Bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Father, I pray over every person here struggling. Every person here who's, who's going through a hardship, going through pain. Lord, I pray that you would give them strength and endurance. Lord, I pray that their suffering and their pain would give them humility. Would give them dependence. Would give them a sense of eagerness to run home to you. And on that note, Lord, I just pray for every person here who, who needs to either commit or recommit their life to you. I pray that their heart and their mind would be open to do so right now and that there would be no barrier, that there would be nothing standing in the way. So if that's you, if you want to start or restart your relationship with Jesus, would you just lift your hand for me? I want to pray for you. Go ahead. It's all right. Amen. I see you. 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 Amen. Oh my goodness. I'm so proud of every single person who's making that declaration today. And I'm also want to pray for anyone who didn't feel like they had the courage to, to lift their hand. That's all right too. This is really a moment in between you and God so that you can have a moment with him and so that you can have that connection back with him and connect with him in such a way that you have the fresh start with him. So if that's you, I'd like for you to just pray after me and just repeat these words right after me. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I know that you see me and that you love me. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending your son to die for my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and show me the path that I should walk. In Jesus' name.